Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Purdue Small Room at Lunch and Learn series. I'm your host, Sarah Jemanski, with Purdue Extension here in Perry County, Indiana. And today I have with me Alicia Rogers. Alicia, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are, everybody. Um, I'm Alicia Rogers. I'm Ag and Natural Resource Educator up in DeKalb County, which is the very northeast corner of Indiana. So today the two of us are going to be talking about utilizing you know, meat cuts from sheep and goats, particularly lamb and goat. We don't see quite as much mutton these days. And so Alicia is mostly going to take the sheep angle and I'm going to take the goat angle and we'll go from there. So Alicia, do you right. want to talk about this? Yep, certainly. So one of the things we need to think about when we're looking at our sheep and goat, um, lamb and goat markets um, is not only kind of our own enjoyment of the products that we raise or that we purchase from others, but also potentially what those ethnic markets might be. Whereas if we are producers, where could we get maybe a little bit more money um, for the animals we're producing? Um, so these are kind of some of the holidays um, coming up for the next few years. Um, Penn State University has a great article on it that you can see here. Um, but these are holidays that are typically celebrated um, with other ethnicities. So Muslims, um, Islam, um, Indian, Mexicans, things like that, that they like to have some lamb or goat as kind of a special treat. Um, so these are some things just kind of keep track of kind of in the back of your head. So if you happen to have some early kidding or early lambing animals or later, um, it may fall in a little bit better with some of these markets. So if you have some animals that birth in April, May timeframe, you may be able to hit the Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, or Christmas market. Um, if you have animals that are birthing November, December timeframe, you may be able to hit some of the Easter, um, Rosh Hashanah, or a few of those other markets. So just some things to consider if you're looking at maybe branching out a little bit and marketing in a little bit different options. So when we talk about goat meat, you know, this is one meat that we really think about as being related to holidays. And there are specific types of goats that people like at different holidays and different cultures that, you know, traditionally use goat meat for their holidays. And so if we're talking about the Western Roman Easter, so we see that a lot with our Latinx communities, you know, Hispanic communities, Mediterranean communities. So for that holiday, you want a live weight size of about 20 to 40 pounds, and you're wanting a kid that is not yet weaned, that's under three months of age is what's preferred. You actually get a price dock at Easter if the kid is above 40 pounds. But again, this is a, a very specific market and you need to have these kids that are ready to go at this time. And we'll talk about what they're wanting in a little bit more detail later. The Eastern Orthodox Easter, and so there are a number of different cultures that you know, follow the Eastern Orthodox calendar. That could include you know, the Greek, you know, Russian, etc., Egyptian, so Coptic Christians also follow the Orthodox calendar. And so they want a slightly larger kid, but it's going to be still a, a young kid that they're looking for. And then there are, there are several Hindu holidays and Indian holidays where they use goat meat. Desai is one of them, and but they, you know, they prefer a goat that fits the size of their of the group that they have for their celebration. So if they have a large family, they're going to want a larger goat. If they have a small family, they want a smaller goat. But the key is they prefer weathers, and they prefer them to be under a year of age for that holiday. And then we have various Islamic holidays. The start of Ramadan is a is a big one where there's a lot of demand for goat meat. And also the end of Ramadan, which are these next two holidays that are shown. And so they want one that's gonna have about 70 to 90 pound live weight. And they're not real picky, they just prefer that it be under a year of age for, for these particular holidays. Now this next holiday, Eid al-Adha, that's their sacrifice holiday, you know, so it's a day of sacrifice. And so in this case, 
they want an unblemished yearling. It can be male or female, but if it's male, it needs to be intact, uncastrated, and they don't want it to have any damage to the ears. They don't want it to be disbudded. So they want a perfect goat that's a year of age. You know, they will, if they can't find one that's over a year, then they will take a kid, but ideally they want a yearling that's unblemished. And then Cinco de Mayo, that's a Mexican holiday, and they want basically cabrito, and they prefer cabrito to not be castrated or disbudded. And so this uh, cabrito, we'll go into more detail about that later, but that's again, is a very young kid, similar to our Easter kids. And then for Christmas, there are a number of different cultures that like to eat goat at Christmas time. And traditionally, you know, you have that very young kid as well, which is kind of hard to find it at Christmas time, but it kind of depends on the culture and what they're cooking. Like if you're so, somebody who has a Caribbean background, they may want a more mature animal for some of their traditional dishes. And then the people that are, you know, from the Caribbean, they have a number of different independence days and things and that they enjoy using goat for. And a lot, there's are particular stews that they like to make with goat meat that they prefer mature bucks for because they, they like the flavor. They think it has more flavor and they want that flavor. <laughs> it may not be a flavor that you or I would prefer, but that's what they want for some of these stews is they want that stronger flavored animal. So there are certain cultures that do want your mature bucks. And you know, if it's if it's meat that's gonna be stewed, then it doesn't matter how tough it is when you start with it, they'll cook it long enough to, to make it tender. And so here are a couple of, of sources. You know, North Carolina State University has a good article on breeding the does to tar target these holidays. And then Cornell has their sheep and goat marketing info site that has a great calendar as well. So Alicia, if you want to talk about the primal cuts. Yep. So next few slides are just going to kind of be a bit of a review from the presentation Dr. Stacy Zelli did here for us a few months back about kind of breaking apart our carcasses and looking at the cuts and things like that we can get from them. So when we're looking at our basic primal cuts, which are just sectioning up the animal itself, we're gonna look at the neck, which a lot of times will be used more for stews and things like that. Um, we'll be looking at the shoulders, the rack, the loin, and the leg. Um, so from each of these, we can do a whole bunch of different cuts from them, different ways to prepare them, things along those lines. Next slide, Sarah. So this is kind of breaking down a few of our meat cuts. So these are just kind of some, I guess, miscellaneous cuts, things like that. Um, so things like our foreshank and breast, those are gonna be found kind of along the, the base of the neck area, um, regions like that. Um, so that's where we could, or we can get things like our spare ribs, um, those are great for the grill, um, braising, roasting, things like that. You can get little riblets. So that's where you take the rib sections and kind of break them apart into little pieces. Um, the foreshank, again, part of a leg. Um, and then our other cuts that are probably, if you've never cooked goat or lamb before, might be a little bit easier to kind of understand. Um, so things like our cubes for stew. Um, I love to use those, um, not just for stew meat, but also doing things like stroganoff. Um, love cubed meat for stroganoff. Um, your ground meat, so you can treat it and make burgers, things like that out of it, or use it in a casserole. Um, and then there's the cubes for kebabs. Um, so goat and lamb kebabs mixed with some peppers and onions and mushrooms. Wonderful. <laughs> so makes me sad that it's like 22 degrees out today. <laughs> All right, so these are some of the cuts that we can get from the legs themselves. Um, now, this is mostly from the American Lamb Board, but most of these cuts also transfer over to goat cuts as well because the carcasses are very similar. Um, so you can have whole legs. Um, these would be more served as kind of a roast. You have a lot of meat there. You have a shortcut leg um, where the sirloin itself is cut off, so the sirloin is saved as more of a steak. Um, you have the shank portion roast, um, and so that's, again, another section of the leg. You have the center leg roast, which is probably more common. Um, it's going to be very similar to, like, a center beef roast. 
You have the center slice. So this would be kind of like a beef steak um, almost, um, kind of like a round steak. The American style roast. So again, used for roasting, very similar. Um, great, great cut of meat for a good roast. You have the French style leg roast. So we can see here where you can see the bone sticking off. And that's just because the butcher has gone ahead and cut the meat off around that bone. So it can kind of do caveman style, I guess you could say. Um, you have the boneless leg roast. So that means that the bone has been taken out of it. You have the French hind shank. So that means the lower leg area, again, where you have the meat taken off of part of that bone. You get the sirloin chop. So this would be, if you remember back on the first column, the shortcut leg sirloin off. This is the, where the sirloin portion of that leg that's been separated. You also have your boneless sirloin roasts and your top round roasts as well. Now these aren't gonna be nearly as big as beef animals, but they're still very good to cook. And then the last kind of sectioning of our meat cuts, we have our rack. So especially on lamb, this is probably the most recognizable cut, our crown roast or our rib roast. This is what first thing I think of when I see the crown roast is, um, yeah. Lost the name of the movie, <laughs> Matthew McConaughey. Uh, yep. Anyways, so where he prepares the lamb for his girlfriend and she yeah, goes crazy about it. But um, so this is basically our rib roast that's just been circled around and been Frenched. So the meat's been taken off the tip of it. Very beautiful presentation um, and not that difficult to really cook. It looks intimidating, but not too hard. Then we have our chops from the rack as well. Um, so a lot smaller than what you might have as a pork chop, but still very good. We'll go to our loin next. So that's kind of the between the rack and the rear leg is the loin region. Um, and this is probably where most of our most expensive. You get your loin, loin roast, tender, um, things like that. Those are going to be some of the more tender um, cuts of meat. You don't have to do a lot with them. Um, very good. And then we have our shoulder area. So this is going to be our square cut shoulder. So much like a pork shoulder, you'll get a lamb or a goat shoulder. You have a Saratoga roast. So this is kind of a boneless. And again, you have the straight up boneless shoulder roast and your various chops. So most of these Obviously, if it has roast in the name, it's going to be used more as a roast, so similar to a beef roast. If it has chops in the name, think of kind of a pork chop, but the cooking time is going to vary, and we'll look at those here in a minute. So, it's like we have a couple of questions from attendees, Sarah. So, we'll go ahead and answer your questions at the end. Okay. And so, if you just want to hang around, we'll answer the questions at the end. Okay, so just a few cooking tips on both lamb and goat. I know this says lamb, but it pertains to goat as well. Um, so before cooking, you want to try to bring your meat up to room temperature um, just because it helps break down some of those tendons, things like that helps with the flavor a lot more than if you were to take a slab of meat straight from the fridge, put it right on the grill or right in your pan. Bringing it to room temperature doesn't cause such a shock to the system of that meat. Um, it helps, like I said, release the flavor and the juices a lot better. After you're done cooking, you wanna let your meat rest for about 10 minutes or so, um, just because it helps kind of get those juices kind of reabsorbed through the meat and it'll help give you a juicier cut, um, a juicier bite. And then always when you're cutting the meat, cut against the grain. Um, so a lot of our meat, like if you think of a tenderloin, the meat is, the striations of the muscle are gonna kind of run with kind of that cut. Um, so you always wanna cut kind of against the grain. So kind of cutting little medallions out of it, I guess you could say. And then don't overcook your meat. This is especially important when you're talking about lamb and goat. Lamb and goat are incredibly sensitive to cooking temperatures. It's very easy to overcook lamb and goat and tough lamb and goat is just really hard to get over. 
Um, so you just want to make sure that you're cooking according to temperature. And a lot of times we'll reiterate this quite a bit through the presentation, but you want to take it off about 10 degrees before its actual temperature, because as it rests, it will still continue to cook and bring it up to the proper temperatures that it should be at. Next slide, Sarah. All right, so these are just general cooking temperature recommendations. So if you're looking for just something general, this would be it. Um, so if you're looking for different for donenesses from medium rare, medium and well. So medium rare, you want to pull it out when it's about 135 degrees Fahrenheit, which might seem a little low, but again, for lamb and goat, you don't want to overcook it. And then, then by letting it rest for about 10 minutes um, or so, actually it says only about three minutes, it will continue to rise and be at that perfect final internal, internal temperature of 145, again, for a medium rare. For a medium, you want to pull it off when it's about 150 degrees, let it rest until it reaches about 160. And then for well done, pull it off at 160 and with the final internal internal temperature of about 170 degrees. Right, next. When we're looking at specific cuts itself, um, you can definitely vary depending on how you're going to do it. So when we're looking at lamb or goat leg with the bone in, um, roasting is the most common method probably with this, um, just because it works well to break down the ligaments and things like that. If you're looking at about a five to seven pound leg, um, this kind of gives you an idea on our medium, medium rare and well done times. So you're only looking at a difference of about five minutes between each of those areas. So you definitely want to watch the clock. When you're looking at boneless, if it's rolled up, again, you're looking at about 325 degrees, serving it as a roast. Again, about 20 to 35 minutes going from medium rare to well done. When we're looking at our shoulder roast, again, this is coming from this part of the animal, that kind of square section up front. Again, kind of treating it as a roast. Again, a lot of these cooking temperatures are very similar, very similar on time, things like that. We're looking at medium rare, about 20 to 25 minutes, up to well done at 30 to 35 minutes. And then our lamb or goat chops don't take very long at all. Again, a small 60 to 70 pound dressed animal is going to be a chop from them is going to be much different than when you're looking at a 250, 300 pound sow. Um, so okay, pork chop. So you're looking at maybe about a half, half the size, um, same thickness, but about half the amount. So you're looking at only about nine to 12 minutes um, per pound. So not very much time at all for grilling or broiling our chops. And then the kebabs, just treating it again, um, much like our regular meat, um, our beef and things like that that we use for kebabs, only about eight to 12 minutes cooking time for medium rare. Um, for me on my kebabs, I like to go more medium. Um, so I'd probably go more for the 12 to 13 minute time frame. When you're looking at ground meat um, for patties, burgers, things like that, treating it much like beef. Um, so a medium is only gonna take you about six to seven minutes to cook. And then stew, again, um, stew meat's going to be some of the kind of tougher meat, so it has to spend some time kind of cooking and breaking down so it becomes tender. Um, so that's going to take maybe about an hour and a half to two hours to really break down. Um, for me, that's one, again, just throwing it in the crock pot with some different veggies in the morning. Beautiful by the evening. Now I'm getting hungry. <laughs> All right, so kind of looking at lamb and kind of some of those things specifically. Um, so these were a couple of my parents' cute little hair sheep from a couple of years ago. But so you go from this to being able to have it on your table. All right, so when we're talking about lamb, what we really mean in the meat market is a lamb is a sheep in its first year of life. 
Um, so the meat color definitely varies when you're looking at lamb versus mutton. So a lamb is going to be much more tender um, because you think for the first few months of its life, it's been on milk. Um, it's had potentially some grass and hay, things like that, but it hasn't had to, I guess, move around and carry as much weight as a more mature animal. So it's going to be a lot more tender. Um, it's going to be more of a pink to pale red color. Um, and we'll see in the next slide that the mutton or an older animal is going to be a lot darker. There is some fat on the lamb, um, especially depending on how they've been fed. Um, that's what my husband and I have a couple of bottle lambs from my parents this spring that have been on about 16% protein feed and they're getting quite fluffy <laughs> right now. So it'll be interesting to see what their carcasses look like when we butcher them out here in a few weeks. Um, but the fat on a lamb or a goat is what really transfers over that flavor into the meat. So if you're not really keen on that lamb flavor, kind of that lanolin flavor where it looks, tastes like you're maybe licking the fleece itself, you want to try to trim up as much of that fat as you can. Similar to a little bit on the goat meat, um, you want to make sure, especially if you're processing it yourself at home or you want to make sure your processor understands, um, you want to make sure not to touch the hide of the goat to that meat because that flavor can transfer over. But again, if you're afraid of some of that extra kind of strong flavor, just try to trim off as much of the fat as you can. And again, the shoulder is going to be one of the fattiest cuts. So it's great for slow roasting, great for a lot of that flavor infusion. But if you don't, again, if you don't like that strong lamb flavor, try to cut off as much fat as you can. And then here we're talking about kind of the lamb cuts, um, most expensive cut with some fat on it, um, just because there's a lot of different ways that you can use the lamb chop. It's beautiful to display on a plate. And then we'll talk about mutton. Um, so this is probably what a lot of people may have been introduced to as lamb 25, 30, 35 years ago. This is what maybe was served as lamb at the time. So mutton is usually the meat of an adult sheep that's between two and three years old. So you can't see too well in this picture, but you can tell that meat is definitely a darker shade, um, a deeper red, and is much fattier than what our lamb was. So you're gonna get a stronger, more gamey flavor. It's gonna be a little less tender, so it's going to take a little bit more to break down. Um, so basically that deep red color and the extra fat, the extra lamminess to it, basically is because of the extra or higher concentration of the fatty acids um, that are found in that meat. Just it's a regular accumulation in the animal as it becomes older, but it also adversely affects the meat. So those that like things like deer, wild boar, wild rabbit, things like that, that like that meat that has a stronger taintedness, I guess you could say to it, just a stronger flavor, don't mind mutton as, at, that much at all. Um, a lot of times it's much more suited to being the slow cooked, stewed, things like that, because it does take a little bit longer. It is a little tougher meat, so you need to work on breaking it down a little bit more. It's also really good in sausages and things like that where other strong spices and flavors are paired with it. Um, that's what we were talking before we got started here. Um, that's one thing we found with our goats, at least when we go to butcher them. Um, if we have any caldos, things like that, that might be two, three, four years old, um, that are maybe a little bit too good to go to market, um, we'll use them as brats. Um, we've got a great market for brats up here in our area. Um, we've got a butcher that we work with really closely that loves to play with the different flavor combinations, things like that. And it's hard to be a good goat brat. So, <laughs> so for an older animal um, that may have a few issues, but is still good to butcher, it's a good, good use of it. So, all right, next slide. Another thing to kind of consider is the American version of lamb versus maybe the New Zealand or Australian version of lamb. 
Um, so for us as Americans, basically we like an animal that we're going to get a lot of meat from. So we tend to go for more of the larger animals in the flock. Usually these are going to be raised kind of in the Midwest. Um, Colorado is a huge lamb producing market and kind of northern Texas is starting to get there as well. Almost always um, you'll see a lot more or tend to see a lot more grass fed lamb than you will maybe some of our other animals, but there's still a lot of lamb that is being grain finished as well. Um, so that grain finish on an animal, whether it's lamb, goat, beef, whatever, actually helps to lend to a lot more milder flavor because of that corn, of that grain in there. It's not just the grass. Um, so grass kind of tends to bring out more of the gaminess of the meat. The grain kind of helps to mellow out that flavor a little bit and actually helps to increase some of the marbling in the meat. So some of that fat going through it. So our American lamb tends to be a lot darker in color, a lot darker red, because we do tend to have that grain fed and that extra marbling going through it, which actually leads to a more tender cut of meat. Um, so if you find lamb that's specifically marked grass fed or grass finished, um, you'll know, most likely have a lot leaner animals, so not as much fat. But because of that, you don't have the mellowing of that flavor in the animal, so it may be a little bit stronger flavor. Now, the New Zealands, um, they've been raising lamb for eons. Um, that's kind of one of their top meats over there. And for the most part, they're going to be chosen much smaller than what we would choose over here um, in America. Usually, it's going to be grass fed throughout its life, so it's going to have that more gamey flavor to it, typically. And they're going to be slaughtered at about a year, um, probably less than a year because of that lack of grain. You're going to have less marbling. Again, pretty tender meat. Um, so over there in New Zealand, only animals under 12 months of age and without incisors. So what you could have is you're still the baby teeth can be labeled as lamb. So it has to be a certain age to be called lamb in New Zealand and Australia. But in the US, we don't have any age restriction on our labeling. So if the animal is 13 months old, not too much of a difference, but when you're getting up to that 16, 18, 20 months old on a lamb, you're starting to get a much different flavor profile going on in the meat. So now we're going to switch and talk about goat meat for a little bit. So goat, we see a lot more variety than we do with lamb because lamb tends to be a more consistent commercial product. And yeah, as Alicia said, you see it slaughtered at certain ages, depending on where you are, if you're in the US or if you are in Australia, New Zealand, you know, or another sheep producing country. You may see some difference with your hair sheep. I think the hair sheep tend to be slaughtered at you know, a little bit more like a goat. But with goats, so we have, again, we have different markets for our goat meat. And so one of the big ones is your holiday markets, you know, Easter and Christmas, you're looking for, and also the cabrito. So this is basically the veal of the goat world. So these are preferably dam raised kids. So kids that are, you know, you're taking them directly off the dam between, you know, with Cabrito four to eight weeks of age, in general, under three months of age is what you're looking for for these holiday kids. And so you're gonna have relatively light colored meat and you're gonna have a very light carcass weight. So you're looking at a live weight of 16 to 40 pounds for an Easter kid. You're looking at, you know, maybe up to 50 pounds for the Orthodox Easter or, you know, and you're looking for something 25 to 40 pounds for Cabrito. But in general, with all of these, you're looking for a very young animal that hasn't been grazing. So you're looking for something that has not started grazing much yet. And you, you, when it's slaughtered, the carcass is sold whole like a rabbit or a chicken versus like, you know, say pork or, or beef. So you're not gonna be breaking down this carcass much at all. You're just gonna be cleaning it, removing any excess fat. And ideally, you don't want a skinny kid for this. So you want one that's kind of a little bit on the plump side, 
but that's definitely still on the dam is what you're looking for these holidays. And it's pretty easy to have them by Easter. It's a lot harder to have them by Christmas. And so that may be a market that you could break into if you have a way to breed your does out of season. And so if you can get kids that are born in September, October, then they can be that right size, that right age for the Christmas market. And then Cabrito, yeah, anytime you have a, say, a, Quinceanera or you know, Cinco de Mayo. So there are a lot of different events where Cabrito, Cabrito might be in demand. And you know, a lot of times Cabrito is used in barbecue. It's gonna be a much more delicate meat than a larger animal. But so while the carcass is gonna be sold whole, it might be broken down like similarly to how you would break down a chicken. It's how you're going to treat Cabrito. And then we get to our bigger animals. So you have kind of two different sizes with your bigger animals. So you have your medium sized goats. So these are weaned animals, but they're not real big animals. And so you might be looking at a carcass weight of 15 to 30 pounds. So you're looking at a, a live weight somewhere between 30 pounds and, and 70 pounds with these animals. And then for barbecue style, and so these these different styles that are referenced at the top, roasting, barbecue, food service, and hotel style, those are defined on this website that I list below. So these are actual defined styles that they're, you know, they're le that have legal definitions. And so you might want to take a look at that document after you look at this presentation. And so Again, the roasting and barbecue styles, you're looking for a small to medium goat, depending on which style you're looking at. And these are going to be broken down into the primal cuts, but you're not going to do a whole lot of cutting beyond the primal cuts, maybe a little bit. But if you look at the style, there's not a whole lot of cutting beyond those primal cuts for these two styles, simply because the animal isn't really big enough to break down farther. Then we have our larger goats, you know, which are the food service and hotel style cuts. And so this is a carcass weight of 30 to 40 pounds for your food service style or greater than 40 pounds for hotel styles. And so these are the ones that are going to be broken down into retail cuts similarly to lamb. And some of these, you know, you may see them just cut into chunks with the bone in. So a lot of the, the curries that are used in the Caribbean cuisine and Indian cuisine are actually going to be you know, made with with the cuts, smaller cuts. It looks like a stew cut, but it still has the bone in it. And so these may be leg chops, you know, chops where you just take the leg and and will just make cuts out of that. But they the bone adds more flavor when you cook it. And so there is a big difference from with goats versus say beef or even lamb, or goats don't marble the same way that some of your other animals do. And so with a goat carcass, they they put the fat internally first. So you will have a lot of internal fat in the abdominal cavity, and then you will have some fat you know, on the, <clears throat> some external fat, so subcutaneous fat with goats, but you're not gonna see a whole lot of marbling with goat meat. And so that makes goat a very lean meat. So even though you may have fat on the carcass itself, the muscling itself is going to be relatively lean compared to some of our other, other products. So you may be asking, okay, I have these cuts of meat or I'm looking at kind of looking at what they might cost, things like that. So unfortunately, goat um, doesn't really have a reportable market yet, um, but it's going to be probably maybe 50 to 75 cents higher um, than what you might see on these lamp cuts. So this was as, a, this is from the United States Department of Agriculture, their national retail report on lamb and veal, which they consider fairly, fairly similar um, in terms of cut and price. And this was as of December 4th. So this is the most re recent report we had. Um, so when you're looking at things like our shoulder blade chops, our shoulder round, you're looking about $7 a hair over a pound for lamb. Um, when you're looking at that rack, so that rib area, um, you're looking at about $9 a pound. Again, with rib chops, um, looking at some of your loin chops. 
Again, the rib chops, some of the most expensive cuts, you're looking at about $10 a pound. The loin chops, similar to pork chops, you're looking at about $7.40 for lamb right now. Um, bone in leg, so again, a good roasting piece, you're looking at about $5.86. And again, looking at your boneless, um, semi-boneless, so there's still a chunk of bone in there, you're looking at about $6.50 to $7 a pound. Um, your ground lamb, so looking at things for your burger, would be about $8 a pound on lamb right now. And your mutton, um, so mostly what they're calling stew meat, is about $5 a pound, according to the USDA at the moment. So. Okay, so when we're looking at kind of nutritional value of our meat. How does it compare? What is, what's it going to do? What are the benefits of lamb and goat compared to some of our others? So, um, so the lamb um, is very nutrient rich. Same with goat. Just a three ounce serving of American lamb um, is very naturally nutrient rich, packed with vitamins, like obviously a good source of protein but it also includes zinc, selenium, um, our vitamin B12, vitamin B6. It's a great flavor of, or a great combination of a bunch of our nutrients. Again, also very good protein packed powerhouse, especially lamb over goat a little bit more. Um, so three ounce serving of lamb will give you 23 grams of protein, which is 50% of your daily protein needs. That's a pretty small chunk of lamb to give you that much protein, that many grams of protein. So it's pretty, pretty powerful little piece of meat. And then lamb and goat also have great amounts of what we call the good fats. Um, so we have about in a three ounce serving of lamb, we'll get about three grams of heart healthy monounsaturated fat, which is kind of the good fat. So 57% of the fat in an American lamb is heart healthy in the form of that monounsaturated fat. So for the most part, lamb is healthier than being unhealthy. And it's also very lean. Like we said, goat is definitely going to be even leaner than what our lamb is. So if our American lamb, a three ounce serving has only 160 calories, our goat is gonna have even less than that, so. Just a good, clean, lean, tasteful meat when it's done right. All right, you wanna take this slide? Sure, so here we have a comparison of the you know, goat and lamb against pork, beef, and chicken. And so lamb is actually a little bit higher, a little bit, few more calories than pork, you know, pork, beef, or chicken per, you know, per 100 grams of meat. And, but again, it's very nutrient dense. And so that's how it's, and that's related to it. And the reason being is because lamb's gonna have a little bit more fat in it than you're gonna see in these other meats. Goat on the other hand, and these numbers for goat are from the late 1980s. And so I don't know if they reflect our modern goat production practices, but, and so, because I, I actually looked at the source of where these numbers came from, and it was from 1989. And as many of us know, the boer goat has been introduced since then. It was, the boer goat became, you know, popular in the, the late 90s, early 2000s, is when the boer goat became popular. And so I don't know how that has changed the nutritional composition of the average goat that we see on the market today. But in general, because of the way that goats put on fat, you're going to have less fat in the meat, even if you have a relatively fat animal. So you're not going to have the marbling that you're going to see with some of these other species. And so if you're looking for some, if you are looking for a source of meat that is going to be lower calorie per, you know, per ounce of meat that you're eating, then you're going to want to look at goat. And so maybe a way if you want to keep your meat but go on a diet, you might consider yeah, a traditional meat or you might consider goat compared to one of these other meats. And so you're looking at 
overall less fat, less saturated fat. And you're actually looking at more iron in goat meat than you are in some of these other meats. And goat fat is going to be lower in cholesterol simply because you have less of the fatty tissue within the meat. And so, but again, lamb, you're looking at, again, this is total amounts. It's not looking at the percentage of saturated fat. So if you actually look at the total fat in lamb compared to the total fat in pork and beef, and then you look at the amount of saturated fat, you're not seeing the same increase in the lamb. So you go, and without a calculator, I can't tell you the exact percentage of saturated fat, but you're actually looking at a little percentage of saturated fat in lamb than you are in your beef. So I'll let Alicia talk about some of these cooking methods. Thank you. So they're basically you can kind of treat goat and lamb similarly in terms of the ways to prepare them, to cook them. Um, so originally when we were planning this presentation, Sarah and I had hoped to prepare a couple of meals for you, but due to some other issues that came up, um, we're gonna just talk about kind of some of the methods to grill or to cook. So the first one is grilling. Probably most of us have a grill of some sort, whether it's charcoal, which provides a lot more flavor <laughs> personally, um, or gas grill, or we have the pellet grills now, or smokers, things like that. Um, so grilling is basically synonymous with what we term barbecuing. Um, so you're basically cooking on a grate over hot coals or another heat source. So you're basically utilizing a flame to cook the meat. So you wanna preheat your grill to about a medium high heat. Um, you want it to basically cook a little bit quicker than maybe some of our other meats and get kind of that nice kind of sear, I guess you could say on the outside as it's grilling. Um, so the biggest thing again to reiterate with lamb and goat is don't rely on guesswork. A good meat thermometer will give you the reliable results and give you the best flavor profile for your cuts of meat. Um, again, don't cut into your meat, no matter what style of meat it is, um, to check the doneness. Because when you break that meat cut open, you're releasing a lot of those juices and you're kind of altering the cooking temperature of that cut of meat because you've now provided another open surface and it's gonna kind of cook differently than if it were to remain whole. So again, like I mentioned before, remove your lamb or goat meat from the grill when it's about 10 degrees less than your desired internal temperature. So either remove it when it's about 135, 150, or about 160, depending on if you want medium rare up to well done, and then let it rest for about 10 minutes or so. I'll do braising and let you take the next one, Sarah. So. Braising is basically when you brown the item in a fat, um, basically tightly cover it and cook it in a small amount of liquid. So it really helps to, to develop that flavor, um, especially on lamb or the goat. Um, and it really helps to tenderize the meat because as it's cooking, the condensation kind of forms over the cover, comes back down and just keeps it moist throughout the whole process. You can either do it on the stove top, in the oven, or in a slow cooker. Um, usually the shoulder or the shank are usually less tender cuts of meat, but are best prepared using braising because it really helps to break down um, those ligaments, things like that, and make it just so much more tender. Um, so you wanna make sure that you sear it on all the sides until browned before adding it to your liquid. So it's basically going from the stove top, um, basically searing it on all sides so you get that nice browning going on. You don't have to cook it all the way through, but just get that brown on all sides and then you cook it however you're gonna finish it off. So whether putting it in the oven or putting it in the slow cooker, um, either of those, of those methods. And then again, on things like braising, you're not really looking at the temperature, but you're looking more at the tenderness of it. So again, when we're looking at the goat shoulder or the shoulder or the shank, they're gonna take a little bit longer to cook down 
to kind of tenderize. Basically, you want the meat will tell you when it's done. When you stick when it says stick a fork in me, I'm done. That's what you do with these cuts of meat. You stick a fork in it. If you can pull off a juicy piece without having to work at it, it's ready to go. So, and typically by the time it's fork tender, it's cooked all the way through. You don't have to worry about anything else. So, so roasting is a, a method that a lot of us have used for a lot of different things. And so this is where we're cooking something in the oven and then we're uncovering it you know, to produce an exterior that's well browned with a moist interior. And so you're going to do this with your more tender cuts of lamb or goat. So you might, it's a great thing to do with the, the rack or the loin. And so it works really well if you have a bone in piece of meat because that bone provides the flavor, but you can do it with boneless as well. And so, as Alicia talked about earlier, that perfect medium rare, you get 15 to 20 minutes per pound in a 325 oven. And again, you want to make sure that you are taking the temperature of everything. And again, don't try to cut into it to establish. Don't use guesswork. And again, it will rise another 5 to 10 degrees after you take it out. So you pull it, you know, about 5 to 10 degrees before your target temperature. And the bone and roasts are going to you know, cook faster than boneless because the bone works as a conductor for the heat. And so it's going to carry that that heat into the into the meat. And so we have a nice example of a roasted goat shank, which is it's not a cut that I would use for roasting, but a friend of mine sent me these pictures and it looks absolutely delicious. And so and so roasting can produce a very nice outcome with a tender cut of meat. stronger flavor. It, a lot of times it's kind of more difficult to think about what types of seasonings, things like that to pair with it. Um, so these are just going to be a few suggestions on seasonings that can pair well with our lamb and goat. Again, everything in kind of moderation. You don't want to overpower it. You just want to complement it. So things like cumin. Um, so it's got a good earthy kind of bitterness to it that really um, you can use the seeds kind of ground up or keep them whole to kind of form a nice little crust over especially our roasts you get that flavor that'll infuse through it um, as it roasts or using it on a grill cut um, so something that you're going to grill so you get kind of the fat of that animal mixing with that cumin it creates a nice little char and pairs really well with those flavors rosemary is another really classic one especially for lamb um, it brings a really powerful, what they call a resinous note. Um, so when a lot of people think lamb, they think rosemary or they think mint jelly as well. So it's kind of that flavor profile, kind of a little stronger, um, just kind of helps really pair um, well with it, especially if you're cooking it with garlic. Whole cloves of garlic with a roast lamb and some rosemary at Easter time. Oh, amazing. So. Um, <laughs> so usually you're chop, um, you'll chop your leaves up, kind of apply it as a rub, um, or you can use whole sprigs, like we said, for roasting. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> so another one is just kind of your common salt and pepper combination. So pepper, we all know, is just kind of that all-purpose savory spice, unless you're my husband and he has to make the top of everything absolutely black with pepper. I don't get it, but <laughs> I like the flavor. He likes, I don't know what. <laughs> so, but black pepper works really well with both cuts. Um, a lot of times the black pepper, if you can get whole peppercorns and grind them yourselves, that really helps to release that black pepper flavor a lot more and gives you more of a freshness to it than if you were to buy already store-bought ground. And then curry powder, like Sarah was saying, curry mixes really well, not just with lamb, but goat especially. Um, so curry is actually a spice mix created with a bunch of Indian spices to just make it more appealing, to enhance the flavor of each of those spices along with the meat itself. 
So it can include some ingredients like fenugreek, turmeric, um, cumin, and some other kind of Indian specialties and spices. So when you look at curry powder, it's not just, there's not really a curry plant. It's a combination of those mixes, those blends, things like that. So curry at one location might be a completely different, a little bit different flavor profile at another restaurant. So you wanna kind of be careful with the curry because they can carry different levels of power, I guess you could say when you're tasting them. And there are different types of curries and different types of curry powders. So you know, the one that you will find most commonly in the grocery store is going to be an Indian curry powder, but there's mm -hmm. also you know, a Jamaican curry powder that's going to have more allspice and then some other flavor profiles mm -hmm. in it. Yep. And so you get, but yeah, curry is an excellent way, especially with your stronger flavored animals mm -hmm. to prepare both lamb and goat. And it's traditional in a number of different cuisines with a lot of different flavor profiles. And so, yeah, curry is a very catch all kind of dish. Yep. All right. Again, you can use it as dry rub or as incorporated into a liquid as well. Then like you said, garlic. We all know garlic has a pretty strong flavor itself, but it, it's so amazing with some nice um, roasted lamb, roasted goat. You roast that garlic head um, right with it and squeeze it out kind of like butter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so oregano is another great one. Um, oregano can, again, tend to be pretty powerful by itself but it competes well with the flavor of that lamb, um, especially if you have more of an official grass finished lamb that has more of that grassy gamey flavor, oregano pairs really well with it. And then baharat is another spice from the Middle East. Um, it's kind of blends, um, again, kind of like a curry. It's got different blends, but usually it'll include things like cardamom, black pepper and cloves in it. So this would be, I think baharat would be great with goat, um, more so than lamb personally, so. So with that, um, there are a whole bunch of recipes out there. Um, if you've never tried lamb or if you've been kind of scared to try lamb, the American Lamb Board has so many amazing looking, amazing tasting recipes out there. Um, but that would be probably the first place I would go to is the American Lamb Board. And it's just www.americanlamb.com. And that's where a lot of these resources came from today was from the American Lamb Board. So if you kind of forget what temperature you should cook at, things like that, it's all there on their web page. Um, we also have the American Goat Federation has some great goat recipes as well. Um, along with Cornell University. So these have all been kind of tested, um, flavor profiles, things like that. There's just so much out there that you can do things like that with lamb and goat that, I mean, goat is one of the most popular meats across the world. It hasn't really caught on yet here in the US. Um, lamb's definitely more popular um, and worldwide, again, a much more popular meat than our beef and our pork. Um, but there's so many things that you can do with it and it's just, it's a really great meat to add to your lineup of meats. Right. I encourage anybody, you know, just be a little adventurous. And if you've mm -hmm. never tried these foods before, you know, find a restaurant that carries them. Now I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend mutton barbecue if you're new to sheep or goat meat. <laughs> that, that's a specialty in Owensboro and I'm 45 minutes from Owensboro. And so that's popular around here, but you know, a good Jamaican restaurant that does a goat curry or an Indian restaurant that does a goat mm -hmm. curry or a mm -hmm. higher end restaurant that is carrying lamb chops or lamb racks and yeah, you know, yep. try it at a restaurant first if you're a or, little afraid of trying of doing it yourself. Or, or goat tacos at an authentic Mexican restaurant. So good. <laughs> yeah, so there there are places where you can find this and just yeah, check the website, see who offers mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Or just get bold and buy some and, and try it out yourself. Yep. You, know, you don't have to buy a whole lamb or a whole goat. You know, you can mm -hmm. talk to somebody who is farming them and, and see where they're selling it. Yep. 
And I would caution the meat that you'll buy in your normal grocery store. So things like Meyer or Kroger, things like that, it's not always going to be a good representation of what you might be able to buy from a farmer itself. Um, and again, vice versa, depending on the management of the animal. So just because you get kind of an off flavor or maybe not a flavor profile that you prefer, maybe from a meat cut that you buy from a store, like Sarah said, try to find maybe a local producer where you could buy a couple cuts directly from them and try it that way. Um, I did a little test on some Amish friends of ours that were over fixing our barn one time. I cooked them up some beef steaks and then cooked them up some grass fed lamb steaks. They finished off the plate of lamb steaks before the beef and thought they were eating the beef. Um, so it's all in the preparation, all in kind of how that lamb was prepared or that goat was prepared, kind of how it was raised as well can make a difference, but it's, it's, it's good meat, so. So for more information, we have some great resources here. And when you go to the, you know, to the Google Drive, you can click on these links. And I especially recommend that meat, goat, and lamb carcass fabrication. It's a, it's a PDF of a PowerPoint, but it really goes into detail about the different cuts. And so if you're interested in the different cuts, that's a great document. And the goat primal cuts, that similar to what Alicia shared above for sheep, but it's a nice poster with the primal cuts of goat. And then there's a good article on the quality of the meat from Michigan State University. But in summary, you know, we'd like to encourage you to explore cuisines that you haven't tried before. You know, and if you have, think about new ways that you might prepare these or think about how you might use your knowledge of these cuts and these recipes in your marketing strategy. So you have questions. Let's see, type them in the chat box or in the Q&A. I see that someone has posted some great recipes. Mm -hmm. So question, does feeding program and goat or sheep breed influence meat quality? Yeah, I would certainly say so. I mean, it's we've seen it in the beef industry as well, the pork industry as well. Basically, what you feed your animals is what you're going to get out of them is kind of my opinion on it. So if you're feeding them kind of good, decent hay, good feed, things like that, um, you're going to get a good meat out of it. However, if you feed them kind of more lower quality feed, lower quality hay, it's going to take longer for that animal to produce that meat, to produce that muscle, to produce that fat, to get a good flavor profile to it. So, yeah, certainly. Um, like I said, what you put into them is what you get out of them. And so Nick Forrest sent something to me privately, but I'm going to go ahead and share it with everybody because it looks like a, a good recipe. Now I want to go home and get some goat out of the freezer. <laughs> so we'll just send this, copy it and send it to everyone. Okay. Are there breeds of sheep that have superior marbling ability compared to others? There probably are. I haven't looked that closely into it. Um, but when you're looking at when you're looking at the sheep breeds, there's definitely your difference between your hair sheep and your wool sheep, and then even your milk sheep. So your wool sheep tend to, when you feel the wool on them, you come away with the oil, which is lanolin. And a lot of times that lanolin, that oil, gets into the fat, which then carries over to the meat. So that way, that way, that's why I said earlier that when you taste a wool sheep meat, at times if it's not prepared right, it tastes like you're licking the wool. Um, the hair sheep breeds, however, have a lower level of lanolin in their hair, basically, and. Um, so you get less of that lanolin flavor that carries over to the meat. And that was, like I said, that was the meat that I had served to the Amish friends of ours that they thought it was beef and just wolfed it down. So there is a difference. Um, but in terms of marbling, 
Again, that's going to be difference between feeding them grass fed the entire time or if you're feeding them grain fed. A lot of it's going to have to deal with the feeding of the animal more so than the sheep themselves. So. So a copy of the slides is available in the Google Drive and I will paste that in again to the chat. Another question, what's the best age to harvest goats from a meat taste carcass weight efficiency perspective? So really when you're looking at the goat market, and you can support me or <laughs> deny it here, Sarah, but when you're looking at the goat mar market, um, from our experience, kind of that ideal weight is going to be kind of a, a live weight of about probably 70 to 90 pounds. Um, so in reality, that should be about a seven, seven to nine month old goat at that point. Um, because at that point, you're going to get that good amount of tenderness to it and you're not getting kind of that overly goaty flavor into it yet. Um, so that's what I, we like to have about that seven to nine month age range is when we like to have ours processed, so. And it kind of really depends on your goals and what market you're targeting. Like if you're ta targeting the Easter market, you want something that's 20 to 40 pound range. And just kind of, you don't want it too young, you know, less than a month of age, it's not gonna have enough muscling to have much of anything on it. Mm -hmm. So you want it probably between one and three months of age for the Easter market. But if you're looking at, if you're looking at the retail market for people to get retail cuts, you do want something that's more that yeah, and I could even say 60 pound, 60 to 80 pound is probably an ideal range for a lot of goats. And once you hit 90, you're getting a little above mm -hmm. that, some of those. It just kind of depends on, it depends on your breed and the, and how your animal dresses out as well. So if you have mm -hmm. more of a dairy type breed, they're going to be bonier and you know, you're not going to get the same dressing percentage as you're going to get with a boar. But even within your meat goat breeds, you're not going to get the dressing percentage with a Spanish goat that you're going to get with a boar. And so it depends mm -hmm. on the animal. Yeah. But so, yeah, so yeah, a boar is a breed of meat goat. So what live carcass weight yields should you expect? You're going to get probably 40 to 50% yield. Yeah. <clears throat> So it's not going to be not as great as a beef percentage um, or a pork percentage. So you are are you're looking at about that forty to fifty percent. Yeah. Yep. But again, it really depends on the animal. Personally, I don't want to have to feed anything out longer than I I have to. And I I raise dairy goats, but I raise a fast growing breed of dairy goat. And so usually when I'm ready to wean them at you know three months of age, I already have animals that are in the fifty to seventy pound range at you know, and a lot of them are above 70 pounds at three months old. But that's with a sonin, and that's one of the fastest growing breeds. And so it just kind of really depends. It's more of a size thing than an age thing with goats. Because yep. you have certain sizes that people want to buy. And a lot of times mm -hmm. people are wanting to buy a whole goat. And if you're selling it for two, three dollars a pound live weight, people don't want to spend more than $150 on this goat for a festival. Mm -hmm. Versus us this year, um, or last year, we had to breed, had a boar buck die on us. Um, so we had to breed our boars to our friend's myotonic. Um, so we had some boar myotonic crosses this year that we kept back just to see how they do. And they took a little while to start gaining weight. But now at this point, they are about eight to nine months old. And they're larger in terms of weight-wise than our dairy weathers are. Um, so we've... We're actually probably about a month past when we probably should be processing them, but our processor also processes deer, so we kind of had to wait for his availability. Um, but I mean, it just it just depends on those goats, how quickly they put on that weight, that muscling, things like that, as to how quickly they'll be to that marketable weight. If you're looking at whole goat or even the cuts. Okay, so I see a question here: How do ranchers get the smaller goats, twenty to forty pounds, harvested USDA? Our local USDA harvest facility won't take them under 50 pounds live weight. 
a lot of these animals are not being harvested at a processor. A lot of these are being sold on the hoof and they're being processed by the purchaser. Mm -hmm. And so, again, these are, you know, these are people who are able to process their own animals and they're buying a smaller mm -hmm. animal and it's being processed much like a rabbit. Yeah, so it's kind of more of that, that, yep, that specialty market. So for us, we've got a few Mexican contacts where if they have special birthdays or weddings, things like that, they'll contact us for a young goat, um, something like that. My parents um, live about 25 minutes from a large Muslim population. So they'll get a, several families a year that'll come out and we'll process the animal there on their farm. We have specific spe specifications that they have to follow to do it there. Um, but yeah, a lot of times when you're looking at those smaller weights, they'll come out and do it themselves, so. Any more questions? I am not seeing more questions, so if not, please be sure to fill out the evaluation that, and when you leave this, it should take you directly to the evaluation page or you can click on the link that I put in the chat box with the evaluation. And we appreciate you attending and, and next month we're planning on a producer panel. And so we're looking forward to that. So we have a great schedule planned for next year. So we're gonna keep these, web, you know, these webinars going and this has been recorded and it will be posted tomorrow to my YouTube channel. And we're working to get the Purdue Goat YouTube channel back up and running so that we could have it in more places. So thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful holiday season. Yep. And try one of these cuts of meat if you haven't tried it before. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you all.